In the previous lecture, we were talking about the receptors. And in previous lecture, we specially defined what are receptors, what are the different types of receptors, what are different locations of receptors, right? Then we chose seven pass receptors for further discussion, right? We also call these G protein coupled receptors, right? Now, let me draw a G protein coupled receptor here. Let's suppose this is a cell and this is decorated with the what I must say, seven pass receptor. Now, this seven pass receptor, right, there, there is one part of, actually what is it? It is just a pep, peptide chain, right, which seven times passes through the membrane. It means that it's, it is looking like it snakes through the membrane seven times. That's why it is also called serpentine receptor, snake-like receptors. These are one of the most abundant receptors on the cell membranes, right? Let's take this example of this receptor and study, make today's lecture. Now, this receptor has three parts, right? Uh, three functional units or three parts. One is this one, right? I will fill it with the red. This is the point where ligand binds. Ligand is defined that any substance or drug endogenous or exogenous which can bind with a specific receptor, right, and bring a change in function of receptors. Now, this part of the receptor, this is called ligand binding domain. Let's suppose if I say this is glucagon receptor, then glucagon should fit in here. If I say this is epinephrine or norepinephrine or dopamine or dopamine receptor, then those substances should fit on fit in here. And then this is part this is part which we'll discuss later. This is transmembrane component of this receptor. This is transmembrane component of this receptor. Then this is the internal part of the receptor right this is that part of the receptor which is present inside the cell right and it is on the i must say in the cytosol this part of the receptor is responsible to give signals inside so what what is really there a single peptide chain is there which has at least two functional domain one functional domain where the ligand will bind what is ligand? Ligand may be endogenous substance like a hormone or a neurotransmitter or it may be drug or it, it might be a toxin, right? This is ligand binding domain, right? And other functional component is this one which produces the effects inside the cell. We call it effector domain, right? So in simple way, what we will say that this seven pass receptor has three components and these three components consist of, yes, consist ligand binding domain, transmembrane portion and effector domain. Today, in the lecture, we will specially focus on our all discussion today is going to be interaction between the ligand and the ligand binding domain. For example, if uh, This is binding over here, right? So what should be this considered? Ligand. This should be considered? Ligand, right? Which is binding over? Ligand binding domain, right? And okay. So what is this? This is our black is our ligand and red is what? Ligand binding domain right and they are interacting with each other now when they interact with each other ligand with the ligand binding domain different intermolecular forces are involved like van der Waal forces which are very weak like hydro, uh, hydrophobic interactions like uh, ionic interactions like hydrogen bonds 
like covalent interaction which are very strong bonding and of course it also depends on the shape and size of the ligand is that right again i will repeat it the first thing which we need to understand when ligand bind to its specific receptors special site which is called ligand binding domain right this ligand binding domain and receptor uh, sorry ligand interact with, uh, with each other with special forces right there are special forces we can say which are helping them to interact them with each other now what are these forces these forces okay the binding depends on number one shape and size shape and size shape and size of the ligand size of the ligand then there are very weak forces in between we call them Van der Waal forces, Van der Waal forces, right? Then there are little bit stronger forces like yes, hydrogen, hydrophobic interactions, hydrophobic interactions. Then there are yes, hydrogen bonds hydrogen bonds in between the ligand and ligand binding domain then there can be relatively more stronger we can talk about ionic bonds and then very strong bonds which are covalent bond if ligand binding domain and receptor make very strong covalent bonds then it is not easy to displace it from the receptor right we call them covalent bond bonds right now now this wonder wall forces these are strong forces or these wonder wall forces these are strong forces or weak forces these are weak forces then hydrogen hydrophobic forces are weak forces if someone asks which is the strongest force you must say covalent bond right right so this is, this is V or W? w. So it must be Wander w. W. w then double A. Okay. Okay, he corrected it that I should write the right spellings. Okay, this is W. Now come back. What are the you will repeat it very rapidly without looking here. Right? What are the factors? Number one, size and shape. Then we start with weaker forces, right? Like Van der Waal forces in between, then hydrogen bonds, then hydrophobic forces, and then relatively stronger forces like ionic bonds, and then very strong forces which are covalent bonds. Is that right? Now our whole discussion is going to be around this thing. The love relationship between the ligand and ligand binding domain, right? So first of all, we can say that there are different type of ligands which can bind with ligand binding domain. Some of them bind with the ligand binding domain and stimulate the receptor, increase the activity of receptor. And there are other group of ligands, when they bind over here, they decrease the activity. Is that right? Now come here that those substances which bind with the ligand binding domain right if they are stimulating this is ligand binding domain if ligand bind here and increase the activity of the receptor such substances are called agonist such are called agonist and then there are other substances which may be uh, which can bind with the ligand binding domain they can bind with the ligand binding domain but reduce the action of ligand binding domain but reduce the action of whole receptor right and if they reduce or totally completely abolish or partially abolish we say they have antagonist activities again i will repeat with ligand binding domain if the ligand bind and increase the activity of the receptor what is it agonist and there are many types of agonists we'll discuss them again and again uh, one by one like they are full agonist they are partial agonist antagonist 
then I will talk about these terms like orthosteric agonist, allosteric agonist, positive allosteric modulators, inverse agonist. We will discuss all them in detail one by one. Then there are antagonists. What are antagonists? Antagonists are such kind of ligands which do bind with the ligand binding domain, right? But they actually reduce the activity of the receptor or abolish the activity of the receptor. Such negative influencers, they are called antagonists, right? And there are many types of antagonists. We'll discuss e and there are many terms used in reference to antagonists. I will discuss in the coming lecture in detail every type of antagonist and how they are different from each other and what are their clinical examples, right? So first of all, while we are focusing over here, right? We have up to now just studied what? Intermolecular forces. But I want to go into detail, right? I'm going to remove a ligand binding domain here. And I'm taking a classical example of adrenergic receptors. Which receptors? Adrenergic, adrenergic receptors, right? Adrenergic receptors, the receptors over which endogenously epinephrine or norepinephrine work. Is that right? Oh, now, adrenergic receptors are those receptors when agonists bind over here, when agonists bind over here, right, body mimics the biological response as if adrenergic stimulation is there. Again, I will repeat, adrenergic agonist, adrenergic stimulator, which bind with ligand binding domain. They might be endogenous or they might be exogenous, right? Maybe drugs, right? Now, so these agonists which bind here and they can stimulate it, right? And they are binding on adrenergic receptors at the ligand binding domain. Such substances are called sympathomimetic substances also, right? I will remove this over here. And I will tell you that when structure of the ligand is altered, when structure of the ligand is altered, then activity of the receptor may also alter. If we change the structure of the ligand and still ligand binds here, we slightly modify the, what is this? ligand, slightly modify the ligand, then activity of receptor or selection of receptor or intensity of the action on the receptor, that also alters, right? So we'll take the real example to teach it. Let me draw, first of all, adrenergic endogenous substances, that is ligands and then their interaction with adrenergic receptor. First of all, we talk about catecholamines. Have you heard of catecholamines? Epinephrine and norepinephrine. Epinephrine is of course also called adrenaline and norepinephrine is also called noradrenaline, right? Epinephrine, norepinephrine and dopamine. These are also called endogenous Catecholamines. What are they called? Catecholamines. It does not mean there is any cat over there. Catecholamines. Now, what are catecholamines? Again, yes. Norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine. Right? Now, why we call these substances catecholamines? The first question is, why we call these ligands catecholamines? Why their name is catecholamine? As I told you, they have nothing to do with the cat, but they have something special to do with a special ring, which is called catechol ring. Now, let me explain what is catechol ring. First, we make a six carbon ring. What is this ring? This is simple benzene ring. This is simple benzene ring. Now, if on the benzene ring, 
at carbon number 3 and carbon number 4, let's suppose this is carbon number 3 and let's suppose this is carbon number 4, right? Now, carbon number 3 and 4, if they are having hydroxyl groups, if we have a benzene ring and we add two hydroxyls there, one hydroxyl at carbon number 3 and other at carbon number 4. So this 3,4 dihydroxy benzene ring, what is it? 3,4 dihydroxy benzene ring. This structure is called catacold ring. What is this? This structure is called catacold ring. So this is basically catacold up to from here up to here, right? Catacol ring. So actually those substances which are having catacol ring, they are called, yes, they are called catacol, catecholamines, right? But they are having some other components also. What are those components? With catacol, they have ethyl chain. What is there? Ethyl, ethyl chain means how many carbons? Two carbons. So, from here we put it carbon, one carbon, then we put another carbon. Of course, this carbon should have hydrogen or hydroxyl, we will see it later. But there, this is ethyl chain. Let's suppose this is OH and this is, let's suppose, H, right? Now, this is, suppose, ethyl group. Here, modification is that H has been removed and OH has been added. Now, and here, Catacol ring, catacol, and what is this? Ethyl, ethyl group, ethyl group, right? This is catacol group here, right? Having on side, what is this? Ethyl group. And in the end, with the ethyl group, if we bind, what is this? Amino group. If we bind, amino group. Now, what will this become? Yes, this is amine, amine group. So, what will be this? It will be this whole molecule, which is a ligand for adrenergic receptors. This whole molecule is having catacol ring, which is 3, 3, 4 dihydroxy benzene ring or simply catacol ring with ethyl side chain with amino group. So, catacol ethyl amine. What is it? Again repeat, catacol ethyl amine. Or simply say catecholamines. So now you understand why catecholamines are called catecholamines. Remember, we are not going to study the whole pharmacology with the structures of the drugs, not at all. But here, this is, I will just teach only this catecholamine group, catecholamine group, uh, just to stimulate your brain and explain the concept that when you alter this ring or alter these structures, how drug is altered and drug actions are altered and drug relationship with the receptor ligand binding domain is altered. Now, let me make it simple molecule. So now onwards, I will make it a simple molecule. I will show it here. What is it? Catacol ring, right? What is this? Ethyl group and what is this? Amine part. I have translated here. This translated into this sketch and amino group has been translated into this. Is that clear? Yes. Now, I'm going to draw this in detail. What is that? Ligand binding domain. So this is, yes, this is that part of the ligand binding domain to which, what is binding? Catacol part. And then this continues and ethyl component bind over here, right? Yes. And then here is amino component and then it is back. So what is this? Okay, I can make it relatively simple so that you don't feel. Now what is this? Ligand binding domain and different components of the ligands are interacting with the ligand binding domain and of course this is 7 pass receptor and this is effector part, right? Here what we have to learn, what I want to teach you, I want to teach you that how modifications in this ligand 
how modifications in the structure of ligand changes the activity of the ligand right now to be very true this is a special substance one of the catecholamine who will tell me what is this catecholamine drawn here is it epinephrine or norepinephrine this is norepinephrine this is norepinephrine because in the end it is having just to remember it amino group so call it norepinephrine norepinephrine has amino group in the end at the terminal is that right at a ethyl terminal it has only amino group nothing more so very small now let me remove it i hope you have understood it all yes. now i will make the diagram more simple now you can understand it what is it catecholine with three four hydroxy components here right what is this here ethyl group and what is this amine, amine group is that right yes. and what was this this is a receptor this is receptors ligand binding domain now let me tell you something interesting these two yes these two what is this hydroxyl group is that right these are very important yes these two hydroxyl group are very important for binding the for binding the ligand with the ligand binding domain it means they are determining the binding power it means they are determining the affinity affinity between the receptor and the okay or affinity between the ligand binding domain and the ligand now if we remove these two hydroxyls this will not fit in here so its drugs potency power will become less or more less so for catecholamines to have full action and good action it is very important that this ring should be having two hydroxyls this is just like two ears so actually ligand binding domain is holding the whole molecule from these two ears very tightly what is this three hydroxy and four hydroxy if you modify these two here ears or remove these ears this binding here or affinity between the ligand and this is disturbed let me tell you let's suppose if we make a molecule here now here what is there what is the sad thing it is missing two hydroxyls is it catecholamine it's not so is it catecholamine no but still it is in many other aspect except these two point in many other aspect it is similar to catecholamine so it can also produce what some effects like catecholamines but because they don't have a true catechol ring we call these sympathomimetic drugs which do not have true catechol ring non catecholamines so those drugs which stimulate the adrenergic system right they are divided basically in into two categories some which directly bind with the receptors powerfully they they must have catechol group so catecholamines and then there are other sympatho mimetic drugs but they don't have catechol ring or 34 dihydroxy benzene right because these two ears are removed they can come here bind weakly so the, their potency is directly acting on the receptor power is decreased such drugs are called non catecholamine so right now what we learned that if a little tweak in the catechol ring can convert catecholamine into non catecholamine but this slight change produces lot of changes for example uh, this is norepinephrine 
What is this? Nor epinephrine. Let's suppose this is ephedrine. Ephedrine. And this is what? Catecholamine. This is non catecholamine. Is that right? Yes. Now, the, what are the differences? This will directly bind with the receptors and powerfully stimulate. This will bind weakly with the receptors and through the direct action on the receptor, they will not produce powerful action. Then another thing, this is highly polar molecule because our hydroxyls are highly charged, highly polar. So catecholamine means are polar molecule. Is it polar? No, less polar. It is less polar because two hydroxyls have been removed, two charged highly charged groups have been removed these two ears have been removed this ear less is more slippery because it is what it is less polar molecule so non catecholamines are less polar now as compared to catecholamine right non catecholamines are less polar so they are able to cross the biological membranes they can be easily easily absorbed from the GIT mucosa into blood and even they can cross the blood brain barrier. So, non catecholamine can have central nervous system action even when they are given orally. Is that right? But if you give epinephrine or norepinephrine orally, do you think it will have significant effect on the body? No. There are multiple reasons for that. When you give catecholamine orally, but actually normally, catecholamines are not given orally. Why they are not given orally? Because they don't produce any significant valuable effect. Why they do not produce any significant? Number one, for example, if there was, hypothetically speaking, there was a tablet of adrenaline or noradrenaline, you take up that tablet, that will release polar molecule, 3, 4 dihydroxy benzene ring. These are polar. So, this highly polar molecule, number one, it will absorb less from the GIT mucosa because it is not lipophilic. It does not cross, what is this? Biological membranes. Biological membranes, right? Because it does not cross, number one, mostly it is not absorbed. And whatever it is absorbed from GIT, it will be destroyed by the enzymes present in GIT and the liver. Why? Actually, to destroy catecholamine, there is a special enzyme which is called yes, COMT. Have you heard of it? COMT. Catechol O methyl transferase. There is an enzyme with the name of catechol O methyl transferase. What is this enzyme doing? Yes. What is this enzyme doing? Right? What is this enzyme doing? This is holding the catechol group and adding the methyl group there. When methyl group is removing the hydroxyl and adding their methyl group, methyl group is highly lipid soluble. That is highly lipid soluble. But what I am saying, COMT. This enzyme is abundantly present in GIT mucosa and in the liver. If you take adrenaline or noradrenaline tablet, which are of course not available because they are not useful, but hypothetically, if you take catecholamine orally, number one, because they are polar, they will not be absorbed well. And even if they are absorbed, they, in the GIT mucosa and in the liver, they will be attacked by CO empty and catechol ring will be destroyed and molecule will be partially catabolized so it will lose its action so this little change removing two hydroxyls right may, makes a favor here what you can take this orally. orally because when you will take this orally now it's happy we are talking good thing about it yes because when you take it orally as non catecholamines do not, not examples of non catecholamines are ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, amphetamines, right? Now, 
you know, tablets of amphetamines are there. When these substances are taken orally, they can be, number one, pass the biological membrane of JT mucosa. Then, as, is it catecholamine? No. Because the non-catecholamines, right? So what will happen that in GIT and in the liver, in the GIT and in the liver, whatever COMT is present, do you think the COMT can destroy this? No. Because it is not catechol. And COMT, catechol O-methyl transferase, act on catechol ring. Right? So, it means it has double advantage that when you take it orally, number one, due to being less polar, it can be easily absorbed. And number two advantage, because it does not have these two hydroxyls, so it does not have truly a catechol ring, so it will not be destroyed by COMT in the GID mucosa and the liver. So it will be more absorbed into blood. In more sophisticated terms, we'll say it will be more bioavailable. This will be more bioavailable when taken even orally. And then when it comes to central nervous system and we talk about the blood-brain barrier, True catecholamine, they don't cross the blood-brain barrier. Again, the reason is the same. Highly polar nature of catechol ring. Is that right? But non-catecholamines, as they are less polar, they very easily cross the blood-brain barrier. If they easily cross the blood-brain barrier, it means if you take oral non-catecholamines like ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, amphetamines, metamphetamine, they can not only absorb from the GIT, not only they escape the destruction by the uh, enzymes in GIT mucosa and liver, but they also cross the blood-brain barrier and they can go to central nervous system. Remember, central nervous system has epinephrine or norepinephrine, adrenergic or noradrenergic neurons are there. They produce these catecholamines locally in the brain. They are not coming from the blood. Central nervous system does have catecholamine. There are a lot of noradrenergic neurons, the adrenergic neurons, there are dopaminergic neurons which release dopamine. All these neurons locally release the catecholamines, but the catecholamines which are present in the blood, right, or in the peripheral system, they cannot enter into central nervous system. If you give a person an injection of, for example, dopamine or epinephrine or norepinephrine, when these substances are given parenterally, right, they will not have significant action on central nervous system, right? But if you give, what is this? Non-catecholamines, they will have significant central nervous system action. Is that right? Now look at, look at the beauty of the system. When it is having two hydroxyl, it has one advantage powerful action on directly on the receptors because it can bind with the ligand binding domain and stay here. Is that right? But it loses the ability to cross the biological membrane. When you remove these two, when you remove these two hydroxyls, disadvantage is that it will poorly bind directly with the adrenergic receptor. If you remove these two ears, it will slip out from the pocket. So its direct action will be reduced. Now here I want to mention direct and indirect actions. For example, in central nervous system, if we talk about this is a neuron and this neuron is releasing here, suppose norepinephrine. What is this releasing? Norepinephrine. So this neurons will be, neuron will be called noradrenergic neuron or if it is releasing epinephrine, we will call it adrenergic neuron. And let's suppose this is postsynaptic neuron. What is this? This is presynaptic neuron, which is noradrenergic, and it is acting on postsynaptic neuron. Let's suppose here is the, what is this? Adrenergic receptor. What is this here? adrenergic receptors and this catecholamine will bind over here. 
Now, it can directly bind with this membrane, is that right? Or on the receptor and produce effects. And if I give, for example, from some other place, if there's norepinephrine, it, it is going, it will mostly work over here and produce its effects. When catecholamine or sympathomimetic drugs directly act on the receptor and produce their actions, we say these are directly acting what? Sympathomimetic substances or ligands. These are called directly acting sympathomimetic substances. Right? Now, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine and related substances which are having catecholamine, they can bind directly with the receptor. Right? But when you talk about, let's suppose, ephedrine. If I put ephedrine here, this is ephedrine. Now, if I put ephedrine here, do you think it can significantly act over here and produce a powerful action? No. So it means its direct action has been reduced. It is not completely lost but significantly reduced. reduced. So we say non-catecholamines as compared to catecholamines have less direct action. But they, they, they can do one thing, ephedrine. Ephedrine can do one thing that it can enter into presynaptic terminals and even it, it can be uptaken by the adrenergic yes, neuron nerve ending and then it will be stored into adrenergic granules. When ephedrine keep on filling this place, okay, I will write it green. When ephedrine, if you give me ephedrine orally, not only absorb from the GIT, it will, on the way it will fool the COMT and escape from there, cross the blood-brain barrier, go into central nervous system, it is less, less binding directly on the receptors, right? But it is taken up by the presynaptic terminals. And when it is taken up inside it, right, it will displace the stored catecholamines. It will displace the stored norepinephrine and force it to be released. You are understanding? It will push it. So when it is pushing it out, so actually, it is producing adrenergic action, but indirectly, not directly binding to the receptor. It has also, it has, we can say, non catecholamines have poor direct action, right? Or they have reduced direct action, but while go, going to the stores of epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, they can, what? Like, they can displace the stored catecholamines and that stored catecholamine can come out and activate the receptor. So adrenergic action will be produced, but this adrenergic action will be indirect. indirect. Now, you tell me, if you just remove two hydroxyls, not a, what you will do? You will convert catecholamine into non-catecholamine. Once it is non-catecholamine, well absorbed from the GAT, escape the CO empty in the mucosa of the GAT and liver and cross the blood brain barrier and in the central nervous system not only it act directly but poorly but actually it is taken up by presynaptic nerve endings and stored norepinephrine or epinephrine is released and that is another way to produce adrenergic action. So what we will call this? That non-catecholamine has some direct action, some indirect action. So we will call it mixed acting, mixed acting sympathomimetic drug. We'll call it mixed acting sympathomimetic drugs. Is that right? Now we have seen this thing that while the stress up to now was the relationship between ligand and ligand binding domain of the receptor. An example which, which I took was adrenergic receptor. Ligand binding domain of adrenergic receptor. And then I made the basic, basic structure, right? And there I mentioned, if you remove 3, 4, uh, the, the alteration of catechol ring will produce alteration of this structure, catechol structure will produce 
big changes in activity convert the direct acting into indirect as well indirect as well so it become mixed actin but some of the non catecholamines they are very poorly binding here mainly displacing they are really indirectly acting is that right am i clear now let's suppose we don't change this another change we make in this norepinephrine molecule there was something here this was uh, beta what carbon okay uh, i must write here this is beta carbon and what is this carbon okay this is beta carbon and this is alpha carbon now on beta carbon there is hydroxyl group am i right on the beta carbon there is hydroxyl group right now this is very important group why because there are two enzymes which every student and doctor should know which catabolizes the catecholamines number one is comt number two is monoamine oxidase what is the other enzyme monoamine oxidase and this is a different enzyme monoamine oxidase this is an enzyme what is the function of monoamine oxidase it does the oxidation of monoamines it does the oxidation of monoamines now question is that what are monoamines monoamines are those amines which are derived from one amino acid monoamines are those amines which are derived from one amino acid let me give you some examples of monoamines for example t3 t4 is mon monoamine they are derived from tyrosine amino acid histidine histamine is monoamine derived from histidine serotonin 5 hydroxy tryptamine is monoamine because it is derived from tryptophan epinephrine norepinephrine dopamine they are also monoamines because they are also derived from certain modifications and changes in the molecule with tyrosine so all those molecules in our body right especially in the central nervous system we say monoaminergic neurons if i say a word monoaminergic neuron it means i'm talking about those neurons which have such neurotransmitters which are developed the core of those neurotransmitter is made from the modifications of monoamine single amino acid example that i will say i will tell you the neurotransmitter you tell me the amino acid histamine there are histaminergic neurons also histamine what is the histidine very good derived from histidine 5 hydroxy tryptamine tryptophan very good and if i say epinephrine norepinephrine and dopamine they are derived from uh, tyro tyrosine right they are de derived from tyrosine is that right now i wanted to say when we talk about catecholamines catecholamine when they undergo catabolism catecholamines when they undergo catabolism there are two ways to catabolize them one way is remove these two hydroxyls what is the enzyme here comt which interfere with the catecholin another way is remove this hydroxyl remove this hydroxyl this function is done by by monoamine oxidase what is the function of monoamine oxidase yes this is monoamine oxidase right it removes hydroxyl at alpha group beta beta carbon it removes the hydroxyl from the beta carbon now look at it if we remove these two hydroxyl and also remove this hydroxyl now this non catecholamine right this non catecholamine so it's very happy you know why why this molecule is so happy because it has removed two it has become very slippery molecule with a very long life span why it is very slippery because it is less 
polar so it can slip through GAT mucosa it can slip through the blood brain barrier or other biological membrane right then it has one more advantage that it here by losing these two hydroxyls it will not be destroyed by COMT and by losing this hydroxyl it will not be destroyed by monomine oxidases so duration of action and half life of non catecholamines will be far more than catecholamines this is another action that just changing the structure you change the activity of a ligand right that is why we can say up to now what did we learn we learn that what is catecholding that is 3 4 dihydroxy benzene ring and with it ethyl group and amino group what is this catecholamine right and if there is nothing more than amino group this is actually norepinephrine is that right now catecholamine can be converted into non catecholamine by altering the catechol ring especially by removing the hydroxyl groups simply removing them or even adding a methyl group here which make it very lipid soluble is that right now another modification can be on beta carbon that we remove the hydroxyl group destroying the catechol ring we make it resistant to COMT and destroying the hydroxyl here and adding here something else for example removing OH here and putting here methyl group or any other group right which is not acted upon by monomine oxidase we prolong the duration of action that is why non catecholamines are taken orally they do have central nervous system action after oral intake and their duration of action is over the hours but when we compare these with true catecholamines they have to be given parenterally usually they do not have any significant central nervous system action when injected parenterally and they have very short half life is it clear any question up to this let's take a break after the break i will come ha huh, yes before i go ahead i want to mention one more thing the gap between catechol ring and this ethyl chain determines the power to stimulate the receptor now this was the power to bind with the receptor this is here lies the power to stimulate the receptor you are understanding it so if these two are here also and this is also having hydroxyl and these two are appropriately distanced with catechol ring right they will intrinsically stimulate this too much it means within the now listen very carefully within the what is this ligand binding domain this domain this part of the domain was determining what affinity this was determining the affinity between the ligand and the ligand binding domain this is the ligand component and this is ligand binding domain but this component this part of the ligand binding domain is mainly related with intrinsic activity the ability to intrinsically stimulate the receptor for example you put a molecule here it will bind but will it stimulate if we put a molecule which is only this part it might bind here but will it stimulate no but if you have this part and this is not properly having hydroxyl it will not even bind properly so it means that affinity depends on how much avidly or strongly ligand bind with the ligand binding domain of the receptor intrinsic act activity determined that once agonist bind with the agonist ligand bind with the receptor how powerfully it stimulates which which determines efficacy there is affinity and there is efficacy affinity depends on how powerfully ligand bind with ligand binding domain so we can say in catecholamines affinity is dependent on catechol ring especially on 3 and 4 hydroxyls presence of these right and 
efficacy depends on many factors in the receptor remember efficacy depends on ligand binding domain it also efficacy depends on effector domain efficacy means the action produced by the receptor it means signal transduction right that is by this part stimulation right so we say that ligand binding domain again ligand binding domain does have specific part to bind the receptor uh, ligand and have specific other components which are able to generate such changes in the receptor that receptor will give signal to the intracellular part and this comp component will determine what efficacy. efficacy then we are left with the amino group we are left with the amino group we can modify amino group also right and modification of amino group will actually what it will do it will determine now this is amino group binding part of the ligand binding domain this is amino group binding amino end binding part of the ligand binding domain and this is the catacol ring binding part of the ligand binding domain after up to now we have just learned that this part yes catacol ring and its binding part they are related with affinity then i said ethyl chain and its distance with the catacol are related with the efficacy, efficacy or intrinsic activity now after the break in the next lecture i will specially explain that amino group altering the amino end alters the receptor selectivity for example how many types of adrenergic receptors are there there are many types of adrenergic receptors the alpha 1 receptors there are alpha alpha 1 adrenergic receptors yes there are okay i will write it from here alpha 1 adrenergic receptors alpha 2 adrenergic receptors beta 1 adrenergic receptors beta 2 adrenergic receptors beta 3 adrenergic receptors all of them are serpentine receptors right all of them are serpentine receptors of course all of them are having ligand binding domain but some of them bind some of them bind better with norepinephrine some of them bind better with epinephrine some of them bind better with salbutamol it means receptor selectivity of epinephrine norepinephrine terbutalin they are different some are mainly alpha stimulator some are alpha and beta stimulator some are mainly beta stimulator stimulator so such adrenergic agonist which are directly acting and if we change their amino end will change the receptor selectivity that's what we'll discuss in the next lecture right so in the previous lecture we made a simple structure of catecholamine right that uh, as we mentioned there that this was your benzene ring and here was 3 4 hydroxyl and this was catechol ring and this was ethyl and this was amine and catechol catechola mean kate cola mean right as we mentioned that there was catechol ethyl amine is that right and then now previously we have talked that if we modify the catechol ring right for example we remove the hydroxyls then ability of this molecule to bind directly directly with the receptor is reduced so it means its potency is reduced or to be more accurately its affinity is reduced then i told you the distance between the catechol ring and the ethyl group right this area is responsible once it is bound then this area is responsible to stimulate the receptor so that receptor's effector part become active. active and then i said the last part the amino group or amino end right that is responsible for example if you modify this end right that will that is responsible for sub class, sub class of the receptor selectivity right let me explain it exactly in a simple ways now this basic structure if i draw like this this is basically 
norepinephrine structure. What is this? Norepinephrine. Let me make first of all receptors as I mentioned previously that important adrenergic receptors are adrenergic receptors are yes alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2 and beta 3. All of them are adrenergic receptors and of course they have different uh, functions and different distribution on the tissues with different biological results on their stimulation. Now we will see that some catecholamines when their amine, amino, amine end is altered or some drugs even which are not catecholamines their amino end is altered remaining is almost same they will do bind with adrenergic receptors but, but with different selectivity. For example, let me draw it and then we see it. I am going to draw one receptor now or three receptors. Of course, all of you know that this is pocket for catechol, these are for hydroxyls, these are for ethyl and this is for amino. Is that right? Now, when we talk about alpha receptors, when we talk about alpha adrenergic receptors, alpha adrenergic receptors, their amino pocket is very small. The pocket for amino group is very small, so we will remove this part. right pocket is relatively small now here the molecule which will fit in alpha adrenergic the molecule which will fit that should be yes that should be now let me draw in detail what is this catechol ring c h o h c h and what is there? NH2, right? And this NH2 is representing this thing. Now, this is the basic structure of norepinephrine. What is this? Norepinephrine, right? Now, norepinephrine can bind here and then it can also bind to another receptor. Let me draw a receptor here which will have little modification and I'm going to draw I suppose beta 1 receptor. Up to here they are the same but in beta 1 receptor even heavier what is this amino part can adjust. Is that right? Yes. Now if heavier can adjust here this is beta 1 receptor and if we go to beta 2 receptor This is beta 2 receptors. This is suppose alpha 1 receptor, alpha 1 adrenergic receptor, beta 1 adrenergic receptor, beta 2 adrenergic receptor. Now you see all of them have almost similar catechol binding units, all of them have similar ethyl binding units, but all of them have slightly different amino end. Right? Now you will see another thing that okay let me make it two here pockets there are three pockets there and two pockets here and this is basically what is it amino group this amino group i can show it like this this will fit over here the norepinephrine has a very good alpha 1 action this is norepinephrine what is this norepinephrine it has very good alpha 1 action it does have some beta 1 action too but very little beta 2 because to stimulate the beta 2 and properly engage with it you have to have a heavier amino end now we come to another molecule let me draw it 
this is another molecule please focus over here again this is catecholamine right what is this ethyl group amino group now with this amino group i add make it heavier what have i did methyl now up to here it was same as norepinephrine and now norepinephrine is methylated what is it methylated when norepinephrine molecule gets a methyl group actually this is called epinephrine what is it called epinephrine that was norepinephrine so what is it epi nephrine epinephrine now what is the real difference between norepinephrine and epinephrine norepinephrine had this amino group at the end but it was very slim and smart it could bind with alpha 1 even it could bind to beta 1 it could bind alpha 1 alpha 2 beta 1 but on beta 2 it fails you are understanding that is why norepinephrine it can act as alpha 1 receptor stimulate on the blood vessels it is vasopressor and with that it may be some cardio stimulant but we come to ahead let's suppose this molecule now this is moderately this amino end amino with yes amino end which is methylated this is epinephrine or adrenaline right without methylation it was norepinephrine it can bind with all of them this end can bind okay i'll make it even more okay this can fit here and dangling some part away but it will still stimulate powerfully alpha adrenergic it will fit even here three of them some little dangling but still can stimulate and even it can stimulate the beta 2 is it right yes. so we can say that norepinephrine norepinephrine is basically stimulant of alpha 1 alpha 2 and somewhat beta 1 beta 2 very little beta 2 very little but when would you come to epinephrine it is alpha 1 alpha 2 beta 1 and beta 2 even beta 3 it is the most balanced molecule which can stimulate bind and stimulate all adrenergic receptors is that right because its amino end is not too short to be limited to alpha side not too long to be slipping towards beta side now i make another molecule here now it become heavier on the amino end it becomes heavier on the amino end what will it will it will become it is it has become so heavy that now it cannot fit well on alpha amino alpha alpha adrenergic but it fit well with beta side so this drug will basically will be beta stimulant beta 1 stimulant and beta 2 stimulant do you know the name of this drug isoproterenol or isoprenaline iso pro terenol or isoprenaline now what we really see that when this end is very smart like norepinephrine norepinephrine has action like this one norepinephrine epinephrine has action throughout 
But isoprotaninol, because the minor end becomes heavier, significantly heavier, that it will not act on alpha, but it will act only on beta 2, mainly beta stimulant, isoprotaninol. Am I clear or not? And now we make it more happy, more heavy rather. Rest of the molecule is the same, only a minor end will be altered. And you will see how it changes the selectivity of the receptor. Rather than two amino group, it has three amino group, methyl group, sorry. On a minor end, there are how many methyl group? Three methyl group, okay? Okay, let me draw it properly. That it's a amino end has how many methyl? Now, it becomes so heavy that it will bind with beta 2, less with beta 1 and not at all with alpha. So we can say mainly it is for the, okay remove it beta 3, just mainly we focus on alpha and beta, alpha 1, alpha 2 and beta 1, what is this? Norepinephrine. Then alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2, all of them, what is this? Epinephrine. Then it minor end become more he heavier, it become beta 1 and beta 2 stimulant. What is this? Isoproterinol. And now we have seen it's extremely heavy. Now it cannot bind with alpha here, right? Even it does not bind with beta 1 receptor, right? So it will be more selective for beta 2 stimulant. So this drug is beta 2 stimulant agonist right and what is the name of this drug yes salbutamol salbutamol and it is also called albuterol now you know if we go to norepinephrine because it has significant action on alpha 1 so it is vasopressor but when we go to and cardio stimulant and cardio stimulant because heart has beta 1 receptors and blood vessel have alpha 1 but it does not have action on bronco it does not have bronchodilator action because it does not have beta 2 but when we come to epinephrine epinephrine where was epinephrine this is epinephrine right it is mildly heavy, heavier then moderately heavier then very heavy it, because it's mildly heavier, it fits in all receptors. So norepinephrine, it, it can stimulate alpha receptors, classically vasopressor, stimulate beta 1 receptor, classically cardiostimulant, stimulate beta 2 receptors, so even bronchodilator. Is that right? Then, we come to the next, make it happy, a more heavier amino end. And what is this? Now amino end has double methylations, right? Here, this drug has left the alpha because alpha it, it cannot bind properly. But due to heavy, what is this? Amino end, it better fits into beta, right? So this drug, I must say, what was this? Isoprenaline or isoproterinol. And this was coming here. It was for beta 1 and beta 2 and beta 2 and yes what was this drug which was alpha 1 alpha 2 beta 1 beta 2 what was it epinephrine and what was this drug alpha 1 alpha 2 and beta 1 norepinephrine epinephrine selected here now isoproterinol uh, this is cardio stimulant by virtue of beta 1 stimulant and bronchodilator. But we usually don't want, uh, in clinical situations, we don't want uh, most of the time such drugs which can stimulate the heart and also dilate the bronchi. Either we want to stimulate the heart or we want to dilate the bronchi. So for, if we want really bronchodilator, adrenergic drug, right, we want a drug which will act on beta 2. 
So its amino end should be very heavy. heavy. And classically, salbutamol sal or albuterol, right? They are very heavy amino ends. And because they are very heavy amino ends, so this will not bind with alpha receptors, very poorly bind with beta 1, but strongly bind with beta 2. Beta two and so it will be powerful bronchodilator. So now what we have learned up to now, we have learned that the action between, relationship between in the previous lecture and this lecture, we especially learned the structure activity relationship of ligand with the ligand binding domain LG, L, oh, LG, B, T, no, I think, what is this? L, B, D, ligand binding domain. So what we have learned that when you change the structure of the drug, right, its relationship with the receptor may alter, right, because some domains of the receptor, some components of the ligand binding domain determine the affinity, some determine the intrinsic activity, some determine the sub, sub, sub type of receptor selectivity. So modifications and slight modifications in the structure of the drug may lead to altered affinity, altered efficacy, altered receptor selectivity. Is it clear? Any question up to this? Right. Now, we have finished with this topic, structure, activity, relationship of ligand with ligand binding domain and classically we took the example of adrenergic, adrenergic drugs or sympathomimetic drugs and on the way in the previous lecture we discussed Sympathomimetic versus, uh, sorry, uh, what is this? Catecholamine versus non-catecholamine also in the previous lecture. Now, uh, let's stop it here. After that, we will come and discuss into detail with simple model now. This was very complex. In simple model, I will try my best that I can explain all these terms, eight terms very clearly. Which terms I want to be very clear? What are direct and full agonist? What are partial agonist antagonist? What are orthosteric agonist? What are allosteric agonist? What is the difference in them? What is positive allosteric modulator? And how they differ from allosteric agonist and orthosteric agonist? And of course, I will teach you about inverse agonist, a little difficult concept. And in the end, we will conclude the lecture. Next lecture, we will conclude with comparing the direct agonist with indirect agonist. Okay?